good evening everyone uh, welcome back uh, to the fof uh, last month we saw uh, the dynamics of the food delivery industry uh, this time around we have uh, rona kon head research and fund manager at ppfs mutual fund presenting on the semiconductor industry so this industry has been in the news recently because of the uh, shortages that a few auto oems have faced uh, so we'll look at this industry in detail over to you rona Hey, thanks, Raj. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, again a virtual FOF, but we'll make the most of it uh, by covering interesting topics, and we'll have a little bit longer time, so people won't have to rush back home. Uh, hopefully, you are at home and safe. Uh, so, just to uh, initiate with some housekeeping things, that if you want to ask questions, you can put your questions in the chat box, and then Raj can relay them at the end of my presentation. Uh, or you can unmute yourself at the end of my presentation and we can do a q and a it will be good to hear your voices as well so like raj said this sector has been in the news for a while and unfortunately for the wrong reasons uh, because of shortages and uh, some sort of supply chain issues and these are the news that we all have been reading the headlines where uh, you know demand was not being met or uh, work had to be stopped factories had to be shut down because of semiconductor shortages and it seemed like a very odd thing because we took it for granted for such a long time uh, and something which was uh, working so seamlessly and never made the headlines suddenly why is it making any headlines and that was very intriguing to study but the problem with the semiconductor industry is the complex sector and uh, the the aim of this presentation is to help people just have a basic understanding of how to understand this sector and how to probably read financial statements later on if you are still interested uh, the audience from this uh, forum are uh, indian investors investing only in india most of the time uh, unfortunately we don't have very strong semiconductor companies in india which are listed in india or might be uh, leaders in that segment uh, but nevertheless it's a very fascinating sector to understand and since india is one of the largest consumers of semiconductors uh, we are definitely impacted by it as well so understanding semiconductors i have uh, mapped this presentation across uh, these several topics uh, will be history and uh, of course with the benefit of hindsight trying to understand how the sector has evolved uh, but i will not go in too much detail because a lot of it can be easily read on wikipedia uh, of course there are different types of semiconductor businesses i will just touch upon uh, what different types of them exist uh, what is the ecosystem of vendors which is the most fascinating aspect of the semiconductor industry Uh, then we'll go into the economics of why the chip shortage has happened. Uh, what are the conditions under which a shortage can happen, and will it repeat in the future? We don't know, but it has happened, and it has revealed itself. Uh, the sector has revealed itself in a way we were not anticipating. Uh, of course, without uh, studying the geopolitics of this sector, uh, I think is another exciting part of the sector. Exciting for the wrong reasons, uh, but still, it's good to see the geopolitical nature of this sector as well. and in the end we'll also discuss a little bit about uh, what is the outlook for india can india ever catch up with the greats like taiwan or us or other countries who have the lead in semiconductor manufacturing but before we begin i would just say be aware a little bit uh, for the sake of simplification and the time barrier that we have uh, also people's attention spans uh, should not be taken for granted i have tried to do a little bit of a oversimplification of the sector uh not discussing the entire gamut of semiconductor products uh also within the semiconductor industry uh since there are too many technical terms and manufacturing jargon is used i have tried to limit that as well uh try to simplify as much as possible uh and apologies to any of the electronics engineers in the audience uh, wherever but because people will cringe when they see some of the oversimplification i am sure uh but fortunately the business is very simple to understand uh if we, if you ever studied any contract manufacturing business i think semiconductor manufacturing is something somebody can understand easily uh, the nature of the economics of the business remains the same uh, also the interesting part about this sector is uh, not because there is too much jargon but uh, despite knowing the capital cycles despite knowing technology cycles a little bit it is still difficult to map who are the clear winners and losers going ahead because so far we have seen existing winners have continued to retain their lead but we have it's very hard to say if a new winner can come and dislodge an existing player we'll have to see that and also uh, capital cycles although they are known 
uh, if you go into different product categories in semiconductors some of these capital cycles can be difficult because the demand has now become very diverse and also not everybody needs the latest and the greatest technology out there so i'm just giving this caveat out there so that people won't get disappointed if there are not too many juicy details and also i have kept the financial uh, details to be to the minimum because most of the companies we're discussing are listed there are about 20 businesses uh, which will be covered in the overall presentation and all of them are listed you can just look them up and study the numbers if at all you are interested to learn about the industry all right so i think if somebody would ask me uh, which is the single most uh, single greatest innovation or invention that has happened in the 20th century uh, it will be tempting to point at the car or the aeroplane because of the mobility advantages and uh, making the world a little closer because of air travel i think the single most important invention of the 20th century will be the transistor and the use of that transistor into the integrated circuit which we now call as a chip and rightfully so in 1947 and the ic's innovated in 1958 uh, both of these inventions got the nobel prizes although nobel may not be the only benchmark but still significantly useful Uh, innovations and inventions that have happened from here and if you look at so again there's a good history and somebody has done a very good job on youtube to explain that history so i won't go into detail of uh, talking about what is a transistor and what is a ic we all know that these are chips which are used in electronic components uh, but what happened in the 1970s is uh, this is the operation scaled in terms of how to manufacture these things the amount of transistors you could fit on a chip started to scale and we'll talk about that a little bit later and something called as large scale integration started to happen in manufacturing processes where you could fit more number of transistors on a single block of chip the direct outcome of that is the kind of products you could then use electronics for uh, inside electronics uh, suddenly changed because you could give more and more features to the uh, chips and you those chips can do different things inside the electronic components so the in invention of the uh, integrated circuit not only Uh, jump started so many different consumer electronics industries it also made our lives a little bit easier it also uh, created the uh, media industry to some extent it also proliferated the uh, sharing of media to some extent uh, we started to get education a little easier because we now had means of communication which could uh, which were again built with these uh, semiconductors so uh, again a totally revolutionary invention uh, which led to consumer electronics uh, industrial electronics auto industrial automation uh, even in our homes we have so many products which we depend on uh, so so again the scale integration manufacturing led to uh, innovation in consumer electronics and other electronics goods and i think somewhere in the 70s uh, any any presentation on semiconductors is actually not complete if you don't mention gordon moore and the moore's law so gordon moore one of the co-founders of uh, the most iconic chip manufacturer in the world intel uh, so gordon moore uh, so it's not a natural law it's just a expectation uh, that in the 70s when the skilled integration manufacturing took place uh, there was an expectation that Mr. that gordon moore mentioned that the density of the transistors that can be uh, mapped on a single chip will double roughly 2 uh, years and that's a bold expectation to have and it's not an idle expectation it's not just some statement you will make in the air uh, there was of course uh, this was also of course enabled because of the manufacturing processes which also were improving so we'll go in detail about the manufacturing processes a bit later but the impact of this expectation of moore's law is the ability of the chip would keep on improving at an exponential pace because the transistors can be uh, put into such a small area Uh, every two years and doubling of that so imagine if you were using uh, x level of computing in a year you could get 2x of computing power two years from now and there was also a trajectory of manufacturing cost which also kept pace with that so you will get the latest technology probably at the similar price but twice the computing power and that sort of a depletion in computing power is still going on so after so many decades of the moore's law expectations uh, engineers and technicians and chip designers and fabricators are still able to uh, fulfill the promise or expectation of the moore's law uh, the decimal uh, just to give you a visual illustration of what it means uh, by moore's law now this is a logarithmic scale uh, so what it shows is uh, in the 1960s we had large chip sizes where few transistors could be placed 
and technology of manufacturing kept on improving and this is where the moore's law shows and by the time we reach to 2020 we have uh, something like a 7 nanometer uh, space between two transistors so imagine the scale at which so the corona virus for example the diameter of the corona virus is more than 50 nanometers uh, we are actually talking about distances between transistors which are much smaller than that but uh, i'll not bore you with the mathematical part of this let me give you a easy to understand example so uh, imagine an iphone 12 which has the latest a14 chip now given a chance to cut this chip like a cake if you cut it you get a cross section which is the gray part they have shown in here now if you cut this chip you will see a lot of these components if you zoom and see it under an electron microscope you will the regular microscope will not do any good you have to use an electron microscope because these are nanometers apart uh, the distance is basically as small as an atom and if you even zoom further you will see this is what is being etched on the uh, silicon of that chip now what is this etching what is this silicon will come to that later but i just wanted to give you an example that here you can see 11.8 billion transistors packed together and the a14 chip is not bigger than the nail of my thumb this is like tiny very tiny uh, so imagine something that can fit on the nail of our thumb uh, has 12 billion transistors in it and can run uh, a phone iphone 12 without any problem but that's not all the more interesting part is the layers on top of those transistors are the connections to the transistors so basically it completes a circuit creates a circuit uh, and different functionalities can be then connected to that chip so that chip can perform its duties very well so there are 15 layers of copper which again is a very interesting process i'll explain to you later but you get 15 layers of copper stacked on each other that forms the actual chip so this is the kind of technological innovation we are talking about it is nothing short of magic and we'll see some bits of magic uh, going ahead when we discuss the manufacturing process but yeah this is how we are this is a 24 billion interconnections on a chip that is as small as the nail of my thumb it is quite remarkable so when we talk about semiconductors generally there are two kinds of chips that are used in the industry one is the cheap chips which are Uh, also known as analog chips or mixed chips which have very limited functionality they will do a few things which they are told and programmed to do uh, and these are very cheap so they can be manufactured at scale uh, they can be found in any of the devices so uh, tomorrow morning if uh, you wish that you had a broken uh, handset a uh, landline handset in your home just open the screws of that and just open it and you will see a, a green color pcb on top of that you will see small chips but these are very very small functional chips uh, which are uh, very cheap to manufacture at scale uh, these are called analog chips uh, they are signal processors basically they don't do too much of computing or thinking they just are uh, chips which do a specific function given to them and on the other side you have digital chips some of them are slightly more advanced i'm using these as place holders or names for the broad categories Uh, but i will be using the computing chip the cpu kind of a chip as a broad example while talking about uh, the semiconductor industry from now on the cpu is actually a highly specialized chip which is designed to do a lot of things it can interface with several uh, different hardware components it can decide what to do so it has to be programmed in a specific way and we'll talk about that as well because that's a very important part of how uh, these semiconductors are manufactured and naturally because there is more functionality and features on top of these uh, chip Uh, this is slightly more expensive sometimes even remarkably more expensive depending on the specific application so there are analog mixed and digital chips uh, there are also chips called as asics asic which is uh, application specific integrated circuit and this kind of a chip is also a very smart chip but it does a lot of things but it does only for a specific application and that is i think the trend for some of the uh, newer age chips that people are designing Uh, so for example if somebody wants to do a large uh, computing of uh, data set for artificial intelligence uh, some algorithm that they have designed you will require uh, certain chips which will be uh, which can do a large amount of computing without using too much resources and those chips can be designed now we will not talk about that because it's too esoteric right now but the mainstream chips that we are all aware of which are in our computers mobile phones are the chips that are on the right side which are expensive uh, hard to make and uh that is one of the categories which is doing very well i found this chart very interesting so one of the presentations by a company in the semiconductor ecosystem for applied materials 
uh, they essentially uh, so this is a projection and of course a company who makes equipment for semiconductor industry will want to project positive things but i don't think they are completely wrong i mean the numbers might be off but uh, the idea here is that up until 2018 the most amount of data that was generated in the world was generated by humans by doing some processing some activity inputting something by a human we did not have too many sensors we did not have too many uh, automation tools that were collecting data and adapting data and patterns and learning from that so as machine learning picked up as ai as its fields pick up uh, the gen- data generated by the machines will also be very important so we will have so many sensors if we are looking at home automation devices if we are looking at industrial automation if we are looking at industrial robotics all these applications will generate data that data will have to be collected somewhere and that data will have to be crunch to come up with some pattern to improve or optimize the process or optimize the product so the amount of data generated going ahead uh, most of it goes going to be generated by machines or sensors or other semiconductors and then that will be fed into some computing system to compute and learn from that data and the contribution from humans is going to be growing at a organic scale but the exponential growth in data generation is going to happen probably from using of more machines and automation tools also another interesting uh, slide which they showed and again it's not uh, uh, wrong in terms of the trajectory numbers can be off but the components which require semiconductors uh, in any of the devices will grow quite a lot so smartphones obviously we think they are always cutting edge but judging by how companies keep on innovating in terms of the chips or the power storage or all sorts of technology that is now there in the latest highest end gadgets that we have uh, smartphones definitely uh, may be at the cutting edge but they also are growing the cutting edge is still growing further up uh, in cars of course you can buy a cheap car which does not have too many electronic components but if you want to buy a higher end car even slightly higher end car you will have tons of sensors inside of it it will have a onboard computing system which will make sure that the car works properly it will have its own diagnostic system it will self correct a lot of these things if it's a slightly more expensive car so you can always have a more number of semiconductors chips uh, which are part of the vehicle as well uh, because of cloud computing data centers are growing uh, even enterprise computing grows as more and more enterprises become larger uh, basic organic growth of that enterprise computing curve is also there and of course uh, in home in our homes as well we are using more devices we are using uh, smart speakers we are using uh, washing machines which have automation in it we can actually program them with our phone nowadays if you have the latest ones we can actually set temperatures there are apps to control your microwave your light switches your uh, TVs everything can be done with a single console nowadays and all these things require semiconductors so the penetration of semiconductors is only going to go up so the 2020 column over there shows uh, a slight increase in the dollar value of semiconductors in each of these cars now imagine uh, in a car if it says 460 uh, dollars that's what 33000 rupees something like that if you are buying the 20 lakh car which has just 33000 rupees of uh, semiconductors in, involved in it you can realize how important that component is because it improves the experience of using that car if your car does not have a infotainment system if your car does not have a digital instrument cluster you will not want to buy that car you will want to buy something which looks a little bit better as well and is more functional another interesting thing about the uh, technology involved in uh, chip manufacturing uh, so of course this is not a comprehensive list but uh, i was fascinated to see the kind of breadth of scientific and technological innovation is required to make the latest and the greatest cutting edge chips out there so you need to have uh, cutting edge material science optics technology uh, innovation in microelectronics in order to make sure packaging and testing of these devices can be done properly assembly can be done automatic- automatically uh of course you have computer aided design and even computer aided manufacturing where you don't need to uh have any humans involved in the manufacturing process because it's such a clean process you know it's and i'll talk about the cleanliness part later as well of course because you want to maintain clean rooms uh and you're dealing with things which are even smaller than uh, viruses in nanometers even a single speck of dust or even a single speck of a virus inside uh, on the silicon wafer which is used to manufacture the chip can actually damage that chip uh, and can lead to losses in the yield so yeah you need extreme filtration systems which are 
not normal we will we'll not normally see them in any of our ind- if you visit an industrial facility you will not see a hvac system which does this you have to and you will not be allowed to visit into a fabrication without even wearing the suits that are required by all the employees there of course uh, we are dealing with such uh, microscopic forces here even the seismic activity under the facility can cause uh, interruption in the yield or even the quality of the yield can go down in terms of how many chips can be produced or even can lead to errors in the process of making that chip because we are dealing with uh, light to etch into the silicon and we'll talk about that later so most of these facilities are built uh, with uh, seismic dampers installed in it so any regular seismic activity happens in that area the building itself can absorb the uh, shaking of the earth and it does not affect the machines and the calibration that they have done for the machines and of course uh, packaging of chips we'll talk about this later uh, these technologies are also getting advanced and testing has also become a little bit automated with machine learning all these things have to come together to make so if you have bought a iphone 12 you have actually benefited from all these technologies uh, which were used in the last year so we'll quickly move to the uh, ecosystem of how semiconductors uh, are made but before that i cannot start this presentation without praising this book uh, so again it's not a very new book it was written back in 2014 and i had read it a while back but i did not fully appreciate it because my knowledge of the industry was not that great uh, but this book is a very simple book the i think you should read it twice you should read the book once uh, to understand what has happened in the history and then look at some companies and then come back and read this book again to give a complete appreciation of how the industry has innovated uh, itself out of a huge capital cycle problem that they faced the book is called fabless uh, because fab which is short for fabrication plant uh, is something that was part of the industry uh, okay so before that uh, the semiwiki.com website and the founders of that website wrote this book uh, they have written other books as well but this particular book is more interesting to understand the capital cycle of uh, semiconductor manufacturing and the reason why they say it has transformed the industry is because it separated the chip designing and the chip manufacturing capital cycles and uh, i wouldn't say it is profound but actually it is very useful because many companies uh, would not have the willingness to go to the cutting edge of manufacturing at the same time going to the cutting edge of uh, innovating on the chip side and that's the reason i call intel one of the greatest companies because they do both and we'll look at some of those companies who are not doing both of these things and companies who are doing both of these things so to give you the map of the terrain uh, again sorry for the bad handwriting and the bad drawing but just to simplify i did not want to use a very complex uh, chart so i made my own chart uh, so we have basically design fabricate testing packaging and assembly as the basic uh, steps involved in making the uh, semiconductor the end product that we are using uh, of course within design there are architecture software the foundry which is helping fabricate the chips and then there are testing packaging units and there are assembly units so just to uh, give you a industry how the industry sees it so this is a chart from uh, an amd presentation amd is again a chip designer uh, shows the same process basically there are people involved they design the chips they manufacture it uh, they assemble the packages they test it uh, they put it into the final product then the product is shipped to the customers and it is sold at the retail point now interestingly the companies uh, who do their own chip designing they do their own manufacturing they do their own testing and packaging uh, these companies are called in the industry as integrated device manufacturers idm for short now there are two companies which come to mind there are few more as well but there are not too many of them left so uh, imagine the ki- like i said the capital cycle of not only designing the uh, latest and the greatest chip but also being on the capital cycle of Uh, investing in your fabrication plants to have the latest machinery to make the latest kind of chips and uh, intel has been on the forefront on the computing side uh, texas instrument does not make the kind of chip that intel makes it makes those analog kind of chips uh, which are the technology is not very new uh, but at the same time the economies of scale that this company has created is actually quite enormous uh, another company called analog devices also is the second competitor in this and these two companies actually con- uh, control a large market share of uh, those analog kind of chips or mixed chips but in cpu there are several other companies uh, and we'll see how they differentiate from intel so let's look at the first part which is designing 
firstly we need to understand who are these chip designers okay so one thing we know that intel of course designs its own chips it also has an architecture which it made famous called the x86 architecture we'll talk about that later amd eventually picked up that same architecture and made their own computing chip the cpu amd is an interesting company because amd uh, used to make their own chips first they used to have their own foundries which eventually they sold because their business model was not very viable in fact uh, the fact that intel did not do it was very interesting and it actually cost them a lot of time in terms of catching up with the rest of the industry in the chip designing bit because of that capital cycle so intel amd uh, these these names are actually slightly uh, well known to us that's why i have mentioned them so if you if you use a computer or a laptop or recently if there with the windows operating system most likely it might be have having a intel or a amd chip in it if you have used a graphic card uh, it might be made by nvidia uh, if you have used uh, a mobile phone with android on it uh, most likely the chip was made by designed by qualcomm uh, if you have used a wifi router uh, or a bluetooth headphone most likely the chip inside would have been designed by broadcom if you have used an iphone or the latest m1 macbook yeah then you have used an apple designed product so apple is also a chip designer apple is not new to this industry they have been designing chips for a long time but something interesting happened i'll mention that in the slide later on but these are basically people who design their chips only one of them makes their chips but they are uh, designers of chips they depend on certain architectures which are available and we'll talk about that now because you cannot just wake up one morning and say hey i want to design a chip for something uh, and you will design the chip Uh, if you are going to use it at scale into different products you really need the ecosystem of having that software and the architecture available to you and other people who want to build on that particular thing should be also using that same platform and we'll talk about this now so the first and the most important step in designing any chip is uh, fixating on the architecture you're going to use and that has a lot of repercussions going ahead uh, not too many companies in consumer devices have been able to switch very very easily from the architecture that they have they have been using because it's just too hard because you cannot just flip a light switch and do it in fact apple has done it twice which is interesting but somehow it keeps on surviving uh, and thriving despite of that so let's talk about the architecture now again don't worry too much about the uh, jargon something which you can always look up later uh, the reason i am mentioning this slide over here and these funny looking words like risc and sisc uh, so sisc is some is called complex instruction set computing and risc means reduced instruction set computing now the reason why intel is shown next to sisc is because the architecture that intel chips have for computing devices that they use they use the complex instruction set which they have developed and they have designed and innovated and uh, built on top of that over a long period of time and risc is something which is a independent uh, or you can say open uh, architecture which uh, one company actually uh, took it very seriously to heart and uh, innovated in that area and we'll talk about the company in the next slide but because of the risc architecture uh, you could actually see a difference of usage of these devices so for example the uh, computer chip which intel manufactured was suitable for uh, high powered and Uh, devices which consume more power like a laptop or a desktop computer uh, but if you are going to use a mobile device it, these chips were useless because you will have to charge the phone almost every time you want to use it it will have a battery life of 1 minute if you use that so for that purpose you needed a separate kind of a chip which had a limited computing power uh, or, and also will consume less power so the risc architecture actually allowed the innovation in that area and somewhere in the mid 1980s a company called arm advanced risk machines limited was formed the business model of arm is actually quite interesting not too many companies exist in this kind of a business model so arm uh, not only designed the architecture of the first risk uh, enabled chip uh, they actually started innovating and creating different versions of it and they then partnered with different chip designers who wanted to move away from the uh, cisc kind of a architecture they wanted to design chips for specific mobile devices or some other low powered devices uh, so in that regard what A arm did was they for every version that they created they licensed that product uh, design to other people imagine it it's like a floor plan floor plan of a building and arm is like the architect and every type of building that they designed uh, they licensed that floor plan to somebody who wanted to build it so contractor would come to them and say hey i want to build a building with this floor plan can i use your floor plan arm said okay fine you have to pay a license fee 
and every flat you build with that particular floor plan you have to give a royalty to them so imagine each and every device and it, the numbers are quite staggering so last time i checked uh, i think by 2019 or 2020 the cumulative devices uh, with arm architecture in it which have been designed so far is in the hundreds of billions uh, devices uh, and in the last year itself arm had up to 100 uh, licensees who were designing chips and these licensees are companies like apple uh, uh, microsoft google amd anybody who has a arm chip qualcomm anybody who has designed a chip for a mobile device uh, they are license licensees of arm and uh, they pay royalty so every mobile device that is sold with a arm chip in it uh, arm architecture chip in it uh, arm gets a small royalty for that it's quite a fascinating business model uh, and clearly it was very lucrative uh, it was a independent company listed on the stock exchanges up till 2016 that's when softbank bought the company the revenue of the company at that time was a uh, billion dollars which was quite a steep valuation at that time to pay for a company and recently softbank is now trying to sell that business uh, the interesting part is within these uh, years 5 uh, years of owning the business softbank has seriously invested in that business as well uh, they grew the business uh, they created new product categories as well uh, in fact if you have been tracking the development of the iphone you will see so many new uh, iphones with new chips coming up every year with different names uh the reason for those chips to exist is because arm is also innovating on the architecture uh in trying to pack more and more features into the chip so now nvidia which is a competing chip designer uh is now uh, trying to acquire this company uh it is still in the process uh, from competition commission point of view uh but yeah the valuation now is 40 billion dollars and the revenue that the company is making i think from the last estimate from softbank's annual report was about 2 billion dollars So yeah, it's an interesting growth for this business as well uh, by just licensing and uh, creating a royalty fee for them. The reason I think this is an interesting development is because uh, so this chart shows the blue dots are the performance of Intel chips over time, and the gray dots, which are accelerating from below, are the performance of the Apple's uh, mobile chip. Now the interesting part over here is uh, you can see clearly in 2020 the Apple's A14 mobile chip, which is inside of the iPhone uh, 12, has surpassed the performance benchmark of the Intel chip. So the whole idea in the past, now I'm a little oversimplifying this, but the whole idea in the past was that uh, the CISC architecture of Intel, which is used for high power devices, and the RISC architecture used for low power devices, where it does not require too much computing power. now these the computing power that can be used created from the uh, arm style chips the risc chips has now met and even surpassed the intel's uh, benchmark and at the same time it can be used in the low power mode uh, so it does not consume the same amount of power to run the chip and perform the same functions that the intel chip used to perform in the past and that's where i mentioned that a great company has been held back because of managing the two business models is here because the innovation uh intel has been on the back foot for a long time because they haven't been able to innovate and create the new manufacturing process uh which will enable them to sell the uh, newer high performance chips as well so it's interesting to see that apple who took on an independent architecture from arm they had their own uh, chip manufacturing team design these chips and uh, they outsourced the manufacturing to somebody else who also has in- invested in the cutting edge of manufacturing to create these chips the new manufacturing process so uh, the architecture of the chip matters a lot uh, as to which that platform you use because people are going to write instructions for those specific chips so uh, for example if you so that's the reason why apple's devices are now if you have apple's devices which have all arm chips in it uh, the ability to install apps across different uh, devices is also very easy you don't need to create special apps for special computers with different chips so at the moment if you have a intel based intel based uh, mac computer you will have to use different softwares which cannot be used on your iphone or ipad unless the software developer has created different versions for those applications but theoretically if you have if you are using the arm version you will be able to install all the apps and use them seamlessly across all platforms so that's the vision that the company is creating from the consumer product point of view but it's fairly interesting that other people who are also using the arm architecture uh, have not reached the same benchmarks as apple's uh, devices have been because the integration of hardware and software is so good uh, that these devices have been able to perform at a much uh, better efficiency 
so yeah architecture clearly matters without the architecture you don't have uh, the software ecosystem who will create products you will create softwares on top of that chip and the chip then becomes less useful and nobody wants to use it so just like we have billion hundreds of billions of cumulative devices with the erm architecture there are also uh, hundreds of millions or tens of billions of devices with the intel chips inside of them uh, every laptop we are using every data center they are using uh, server chips which are made by intel so it's, it's 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 a race it's ongoing and in fact the next step of the race is going to be uh, more computing devices uh, consumer devices with arm chips like laptops and computers desktop computers and even servers with arm chips and that is the next step of the innovation so clearly intel uh, was a little bit out competed by some of its peers in this area the second and the most interesting part uh, so far is the softwares that are used to uh, make these designs and these softwares are called in the technical jargon electronic design automation softwares eda for short now what do these softwares do so uh, when the design company the, the chip designing companies they go and design chips they don't use uh, photoshop or corel draw something like that to do the chip designing there are very very specialized softwares which have uh, its own innovation cycle right from the uh, late 70s to the early 80s these companies have created these ip intellectual property to basically uh, allow chip designers to design softwares and simulate design the uh, chips with the architecture required and simulate the performance in a virtual environment the simulation is very important because the older chip of that generation has a performance benchmark which can be inputted into this software and then people can test how the new chip which you have designed compares to that and uh, based on this you can also make sure that you are adding more features your so when we said that there were 12 billion transistors in the uh, iPhone's A14 chip of course the A13 chip before that had a fewer transistors over there so these transistor placement the placement of these interconnections everything can be designed based on these softwares and softwares will have some uh, preset patterns which you can use uh, which have been previously successful and you can build on top of that so this is a incremental innovation that you can do every time that software is used so these softwares are critically important without them you may not be able to design anything uh, of a viable chip which can be used at scale and which will also perform very well so you can also simulate the behavior and the performance of these chips uh, later on you can also optimize the performance of these chips so if you realize that by changing the few connections by placing the, the placing the transistors in a different way something you can change in the design can affect the performance incrementally without compromising what you want the chip to do then you can also keep on doing this optimization process continuously uh, and till this point you have not even made a single chip okay so prototype can be made on the basis of this and the last part which is i think one of the most important part uh, that is as so it's like if you have clicked a photo and uh, you want to put it on a frame you will print it with a printer in the same way there are very really specialized uh, printers which create a thing called as a photo mask and i'll come to this later but keep this term in your mind it's called a photo mask which is basically the design of the chip gets uh, printed on a photographic uh, element which is used in the manufacturing process later on but interestingly uh, again it's a 10 billion dollar a year kind of a business and only three companies basically control 80% of this industry uh, synopsis is the largest one cadence followed by uh, mentor graphics which is now part of siemens it's called siemens eda now mentographics was listed till 2017 uh, so i think then growth of the industry is the same but uh, these three companies still control close to 80% of the revenues over here and there will be of course smaller companies in the industry it's not like this have the monopoly but yeah these three companies are the critical component without these three companies you may not be able to design chips of course if you look at the numbers the gross margin of this industry is uh, like crazy crazy it's like a software business 80% gross margin consistent roe performance across i don't have the numbers for mentor graphics after 2017 so i didn't include them but the gross margins and roe were similar uh, up until time they were listed after the architecture the software used to design the chip creating the photo mask will come to the most important part of actually making the chip and it starts here this is uh, grains of sand zoomed at unnatural <laughs> uh magnification but yeah this is a grain of sand but this is not any normal sand which we find on the street or on the beach this sand is essentially called quartz and this has high density of silicon in it and silicon 
uh, after a process you create these cylinders and you chop this slice this cylinders into small wafers like pizzas you know like a 8 inch pizza base or a 12 inch pizza base you slice them into these fine wafers you can see one at the bottom or on the bottom right and here is a kids version of how to explain this so once you have slice those wafers so at the bottom you can see silicon wafer that is the sliced wafer that you can see over here uh, it of course there is a treatment process on top of that it goes into a clean room uh, and this is the process called photolithography again a very old process but it has been innovated consistently and quite rapidly to a magical level now the photolithography literally means you use light to print something on a physical object you actually etch uh, the contents of that photo mask onto that uh, silicon wafer so the photo mask is basically the pattern that you want to print on that particular silicon wafer here is a little bit sophisticated version of the same thing so the photo mask is basically the output from the software we saw earlier which the chip designer will provide to the manufacturer the manufacturer will have this photo mask inserted into the system and uh, it will basically print uh, individual chips as you can see over there in the grids now this process uh, takes a while so up until the silicon wafer is made uh, to the photo mask being put in uh, and it has to of course fit into that parameter of the chip it has also make sure that there is no uh, like i said no fine particles inside it's a clean environment you cannot have uh, any sort of interruption in that environment and it keeps on printing uh, and it can basically print 24 hours a day so you just need to have people working in shifts to make sure that the work is doing on properly after this uh, a very very interesting and crazy process is called uh, chemical vapor deposition most of us know this because cvd is the way uh, artificial diamonds are made but in this context uh, cvd is used to actually uh, drop vapor of uh, say copper or aluminum or tungsten depending on the chip you are trying to create uh, to create these layers of circuitry on top of the at the bottom you can see the black thing it's the transistors the silicon wafer on top of that you have to create the uh, layer of circuitry which will have different functionality everything is planned okay this is all uh, planned and this the machines which are used to create this particular thing are capable of making this fine architecture at a extremely nano uh, meter kind of a scale so you can see billions of interconnections being created and this is all going to go in the final chip which is then going to go into some device and all these things are made into uh, these gigantic yellow colored factories and gigantic is an understatement these are like 6 7 football fields uh, together and uh, they will have a la large amount of these machines lined up and there will be the ceiling the ceiling you can see the rail track going these are basically the tracks which carry all the wafers across the factory to different machines for different processes now i will take a little bit of a pause here and just to give you uh, the highlights of the foundry economics so why why many people have stopped Uh, doing both like designing the chips and uh, manufacturing them as well is because the economics of the foundry uh, is not for the faint hearted so first of all it's heavy capital expenditure and heavy doesn't just justify the number so for example tsmc taiwan semiconductor manufacturing company the largest foundry in the world which only makes chips they don't design their chips they just make for somebody they're a contract manufacturer they're like a generic pharma company they take an api from somebody and make it for them a cramps business uh, but in a chip kind of a industry so they they their capex last year was 20 billion dollars and they make the most cutting edge chips out there so apple exclusively works with taiwan semiconductor to manufacture all their latest chips so they are in that league of uh, uh, manufacturers uh, of course uh, even intel if you see the manufacturing capex that they are doing is about in the range of 15 billion dollars Uh, most of the companies will have some crazy number in terms of uh, uh, investments that they have to put just to make a factory run and this includes your land this includes the machinery that is required for actually manufacturing the photolithography machinery that you require other ancillary equipment required to create all these things packaging testing equipment required plus you need a very good quality power supply you, should, you cannot start a chip manufacturing uh, factory fabrication factory somewhere where they have load shedding you know you, you just cannot do that you need continuous power you need good quality power of a certain voltage you will have your own power transformers and stations inside of your uh, facility as well because these are huge plants which require large amount of power you also need large amount of clean water supply uh, so because of water supply constraints all over the world most of these companies have a separate water filtration system installed that's what i also meant by having ancillary equipment 
uh, to manage your waste water and recycle it to use it back in the process and this is not a regular tap water or a clean uh, filtered or boiled water this is like a ultra purified water which is required uh, in the process of manufacturing these uh, chips and these wafers are cleaned with that of course uh, you need skilled labor i mean these machines are uh, hundreds of bil- hundreds of millions of dollars in cost so the latest machine that one of the equipment makers shipped which is the most cutting edge machine for chip manufacturing it costs as much as a boeing jumbo jet so it's 150 million dollars is the cost of that machine just one machine and it comes with its own maintenance contracts and you need to have people stationed from that company inside your fabrication plant so that they will maintain and use that machine properly so again uh, skilled labor is an understatement you need a generation of labor available on tap to make sure that the facilities can be run well Uh, of course if you uh, if you manage to put all these things together then you have to worry about the competition because your competition also is trying to use their capital to come up with the latest factory with the latest technology uh, and in case you are also comfortable with the competition you are able to beat the competition and keep them at bay to some extent uh, you also have to keep uh, keep in pace with the technology change that is happening so imagine if somebody gives you an iphone 12 and says that hey this iphone 12 has the same chip that was used 5 years ago you're not going to buy it you're not going to spend that kind of money on that device uh, so you will want everybody wants new thing right so new things cost a lot of money and at pace of change of technology the innovation cycle is so fast so the, your actual capacity sometimes can be redundant in 5 years time so imagine you have to not only build everything put everything together but in 5 years you have to make enough profit so that you can keep on also investing in the new cycle of innovation and then you have to have a mix of uh, manufacturing capacity some with old technology some with new technology and then that's how you make your margins and if you are god forbid in the uh, commodity semiconductor manufacturing industry like companies who manufacture uh, computer rams or very commodity kind of chips which are uh, used quite often but there's a different commodity cycle for them as well and if you god forbid get caught in the bad end of the cycle and you are over levered or you're not able to grow and many companies have been doomed and over the past i think 20 25 years there's a huge consolidation of manufacturing entities because of these unforgiving cycles but the interesting part is the companies who survived their cycles are actually not as worse now as they were before because they have been able to manage the troughs quite well even in the worst part of the cycle they are able to eke out a little bit of profit and not or even not lose too much money or too much cash but to give you the global idea of uh, where the foundries exist and this is only the foundries these don't include the uh, capacities of intel or texas instruments or companies who make their own chips uh, design and make their own chips these are only pure foundry companies who only manufacture they are contract manufacturers of semiconductors so of course because the tsmc is the largest company in this 63% of the global uh, revenue is generated from these foundries in taiwan and then you have south korea because samsung is a very large player and growing at a quite a rapid pace in terms of putting up foundry capacity followed by little bit of china and other parts of the world who also have different uh, foundries some of them are also owned by uh, samsung or tsmc or global foundries etc but if you look at uh, the revenue of market share by company you will see clearly it's a close to 100 billion dollar industry per year just manufacturing chips for somebody else uh, so tsmc clearly is the leader over here in terms of revenue this does not include the capacities uh, which are lower uh, old technology plus new technology this is like entire uh, gamut of technology that they have uh, to offer as a capacity for manufacturing and 55% of revenue share goes to tsmc alone then you have samsung uh, and this is the only the foundry bit of samsung this is an estimated from the filings of the company then you have uh, umc another taiwanese company Uh, which is also quite good global foundries is owned by the abu dhabi sovereign wealth fund uh, then you have a, a chinese company started by a former employee of tsmc back in the 90s called smic and you have other uh, pure play foundries which are out there who also outsource their capacity to other people so it's it's quite a large industry but few number of players these people control i think close to 70% of the manufacturing by revenue of microprocessors uh, from the pure foundry point of view so again after a steep consolidation uh, of 20 years uh, these are the final companies which are left the problem over here as well is the biggest bottleneck is uh, if you are going to be on the cutting edge technology treadmill you also have to be uh, on the cutting edge of investing at the same time in the machinery 
and that leads me to the next part of the presentation about the equipment manufacturers and i want to dazzle you with this photo just for a bit so i mean if you see this photo i don't know what it is it just seems like some uh, very unique instrument designed for some scientific experiment uh, and which will only be used once or twice or whatever i mean it's like a very unique piece of equipment used but actually it's a machine that manufactures chips the it's it's a uv machine extreme ultraviolet lithography machine which is designed by a company called uh, asml it's a dutch company it's one of the most cutting edge uh, chip manufacturing equipment makers in the world and the reason i wanted to show this to you is uh, what it does is actually magic and it reminded me of this quote by arthur c clarke where he says that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic if you don't know what it, what you're seeing and the first time when i saw this video and i think after this presentation is over and you have the bandwidth you just spend the next 12 minutes and watch this particular uh, video uh, i'm leaving the slide on for a bit so that you can copy the text that is there so uh, there's a channel called seeker and uh, they just wanted to show how the uh, uv lithography machine the extreme ultraviolet lithography machine actually works and what technology is involved in it it is astounding it is just magical i could not believe my eyes and my ears when i was listening to what they were explaining i spent a lot of time reading about it later and still can understand what they were doing it is so so cool the moment you see the video and the animations that they use to show how the process works and it will blow your mind if you bought an iphone 12 this is the machine that was used to actually make the chip which is inside your iphone 12 it is outstanding and do do watch it definitely after this presentation is over but it is the kind of magical innovation that has happened in this industry which has led to uh, fulfilling the expectations of moore's law so this is not some idle innovation that happens in vacuum this is actually towards an end to make sure that the computing power keeps on exponentially growing year after year and we get cheaper and cheaper devices i mean no other industry has this particular mindset where same computing power is available at the same price sorry uh, twice the computing power at the same price which you bought uh, Two years back or a year ago, so this is actually outstanding. And if you see the process in action, you will actually be aghast that no, how can anybody keep up with this? How can anybody buy a one fifty million dollar machine? And it's not just the one fifty million dollar machine; it's also the other things you have to build around it uh, to make sure that you can run the machine well. You can have a good yield of the product. So most of the uh, really well run companies like TSMC, uh, they advertise a yield of about ninety percent plus. So ninety percent of their wafers. Uh, generate good quality chips and they can be sold uh, and they work in the devices so imagine if they are at 90 and they are the best uh, how bad can some of the others be so yeah the yields also determine your economics of running that foundry uh, with all these equipment it's a fascinating industry just the manufacturing machinery itself and this industry also is cornered uh, by five to six players uh, again all these players combined Uh, have about seventy percent market share, and each player makes different items in this. So applied material ASML compete directly. Lam Research makes different kind of machines for different kind of chips. Uh, Tokyo Electron also makes some different kind of chips. KLA also makes some ancillary equipment which is required. So anything that is required to create a finished uh, chip uh, goes through one of these machines, which are made by these companies. Uh, again, heavy consolidation acquisitions make sure that these companies have stayed profitable for a long time. you can clearly see gross margins are uh, very very healthy for these businesses uh, in fact ro's are also quite healthy these are high margin high asset turn businesses uh, which are run on very low debt and out, after all this crazy magical process you get something like this which is a, a silicon wafer completely etched with chips that are ready and the next process after this is the testing and packaging phase so before this Uh, thing starts so for example if you see the grid of chips over here uh, one of these chips will be removed individually after testing the entire wafer for its integrity they will cut the chips uh, out of that wafer and they will take one of these chips and they will package it into the final chip which is going to go into some consumer device so for example if you're looking at a cpu the chip that we saw coming out of the wafer is a small component of this particular uh, microchip and then this component or even some of the simpler chips like texas instruments has these uh, analog chips which are used uh, these are packaged in this way and once the chip is fully packaged they will go on to this kind of a interface and afterwards it will be assembled with the end consumer product that we use it can be a computer it can be a mobile phone it can be whatever device we are using which requires that chip uh, this will be installed on that consumer product and that will be assembled by somebody else 
So the companies that we see in India, which are assembling the iPhones and the Xiaomi's and other phones in India, they are essentially the assembly players, which are at the lower end of assembly. They are not doing the high-end uh, chip assembly over here. They are just assembling the products together and making sure that the screens attach, the batteries attach, everything is attached. But they are not designing the circuit uh, of the entire mobile device. That is designed by somebody in China. And the chip which goes into that circuit is designed by somebody who is in Taiwan or made in somebody in Taiwan. So we saw that this is all an intricate supply chain, which of course uh, you want to believe that there will be more chip shortages, right? But the problem is it has not happened before in the scale it has happened in the last year. And of course, with the COVID pandemic, everything gets washed by the same brush. Oh, because of COVID, uh, you know, the poor infrastructure of the uh, chip supply chain has been exposed to us, uh, which also led me to, uh, again, an interesting side note that if you want to read this book, please go ahead and pick it up. It's a fantastic book. It talks about the exact same problem that otherwise a very well-run ecosystem or infrastructure is invisible to us because it is always functioning and doing its work. Uh, but when something breaks, that's when it becomes visible to us. And that's what happened in the last year. So let me illustrate this with an example. So imagine uh, a company like Toyota, a car manufacturer, uh, wants to, uh, it knows its production schedule. Uh, it, it has a vendor called Panasonic, which makes the infotainment display in the car. Uh, where we can you know, select our music and whatever and see the map on the car. So now this Panasonic company is good at making that display and that product which is going into Toyota car, but it does not manufacture all the components for that. A chip that is go that goes inside the infotainment system is in fact made by a company, say like Infineon. Uh, and Toyota knows that they will need some cars. They will place an order with Panasonic. A month will go by for Panasonic to make sure that this production uh, is available with Infineon. Infineon. They'll inform Infineon by the time two months have gone by. Infineon will then tell, uh, Infineon also does not make that chip. They will design that chip, which goes into the infotainment display. Uh, and in fact, they will go to one of the contract manufacturing foundries and tell them, hey boss, uh, we have an order over here. Why don't you fulfill it? So by the time Toyota pulled the trigger on ordering a particular part, till it went to the foundry and a fin final product was manufactured out of that. And it went into the Panasonic infotainment display and went back to Toyota as a finished product to go inside the car, it took a period of average and approximately three to four months. So you can realize that the supply chain is long. There's just a lead time. You cannot uh, break that lead time. It just takes that much time to make something uh, when you want to do. And Toyota is going to use only one part from this particular company. Maybe they have thousands of other vendors who are uh, sending other parts and then they will have the inventory of parts and they will assemble it into a fully working car and deliver it to the customer. Imagine last year, uh, Toyota would have anticipated, hey, we think that the pandemic and lockdowns will uh, have a demand problem. We will not have as much demand as we had last year. Let's inform our vendor, Panasonic, that we will not require that many infotainment displays. Uh, Panasonic says, hey, fine. Uh, if you don't require that many displays, we'll come back later and hope to work with you in the future. They will again pass on that message to Infineon. Infineon will say, hey, too bad. Uh, maybe we'll come back later in the future to work with you. Infineon then tells the foundries, uh, that, hey, we will not have the same order that we gave you last year because uh, my customer does not have the kind of demand right now. So the foundry says, fine, uh, you don't want to give the order to us, but there's another industry who requires chips right now, uh, which is in huge demand. So since there is less demand from the auto industry right now, let's shift some of this production capacity to manufacture the other industry's chips which are required. So we saw because of work from home, school from home, uh, you will have huge number of computing devices were bought in the last year just to fulfill that uh, work from home kind of a demand. And that demand was not part of the regular demand of all these products. So clearly, wherever the other chips from other uh, areas were not demanded, that capacity went to all the other computing devices which were then sold. Now, since we saw the delay that went into the entire process, it at least takes four months. Imagine if Toyota suddenly mid-quarter realized, hey, we anticipated incorrectly. Actually, there is going to be a larger demand for passenger vehicles. Let's go back to our vendor Panasonic and tell them, hey, we actually want more order this time because we um, miscalculated the demand earlier. But actually, there is more demand. We want to buy more products from you than last year. So Panasonic will take the order. But again, it will have to go to the same channel of Panasonic, Infineon, and then the foundries. And the foundries cannot magically create the capacity because we saw how much painstakingly hard it is to build capacity of foundries. They cannot magically wish that they had more capacity. They'll have to go through the same process of acquiring land, making sure the facility is running, testing it, making sure the chips out of that are also possibly good quality product. 
and the company like asml applied material so for example asml only makes 50 of those machines in a year now if the entire capacity of asml is booked by all these foundries and there is no capacity left to add another machine or sell another machine even if they want to they cannot do it so all these vendors get stuck at the foundry and that's when we see headlines plastered with tsmc's name global foundry's name all over the place because uh, the foundry is supposed to be the bottleneck now and not the uh, i would say irregular demand from the other sectors so clearly the car which would have taken four years to four months to get that particular component from this panasonic vendor will now take five months six months or whatever time so if you had the inventory of the product with you good luck and you would have sold more number of cars to fulfill the sudden surge in demand but if not you're stuck so there are several examples of companies where products have been delivered after five six months after the customer has booked now it's quite crazy uh, it has never happened in the past and nobody noticed why it did not happen but now that we realize how critical the uh, capital cycle is and so difficult to increase capacity of chip manufacturing uh, we are seeing the effect in the chip shortages and this is actually going to accelerate so when we see numbers like you know tsmc wants to put in 28 billion dollars to make a make new facilities across the world not just in taiwan but even in the us uh, intel is going to put in new capacity to become a foundry manufacturer for the people they are also going to hire tsmc to go to the cutting edge because their process has been delayed other foundries are also promising to expand samsung has actually given a plan of 200 billion dollars over the next 10 years these are crazy numbers but once you see how crazy the demand is going to be they don't seem to be that crazy anymore so if you can do something well and you can expand your business but without breaking your balance sheet i think this is a good way for all these companies to expand so i mean we have seen the complex manufacturing process the capital cycle the technology involved the history of all these devices but there is also another history which is interesting to learn and especially because most of the manufacturing happens in asia uh, a very interesting book which i had read earlier uh, which talks about uh, say after second world war till now how the industrial nations in asia especially southeast asia which is uh, which includes china which also includes south korea japan philippines taiwan thailand malaysia all these companies how did these companies how did these countries actually become industrialized uh, what kind of political systems they had uh, and what sort of economic policies they uh, implemented to become the companies they are today it's actually easy to look in hindsight and say yeah okay this happened that's why it happened but when you read the book you realize how complex some of the interactions were and how less favorable they were from democratic point of view which we have the benefit of hindsight today we will think they were little less democratic in the way they implemented some of these uh, industrial expansions so it's a very good book if you want to get a birds eye view of what happened before reading the financial statements and a very very interesting book also uh, called only the paranoid survive and it's a cool title written by a cool guy called andy grow so andy grow was a former ceo chairman of intel uh, his life story is amazing forget about that for a while you can read that later but the interesting part about this book is it talks about uh, intel's journey itself so intel used to be a manufacturer of uh, memory chips uh, which in, which the industry got Uh, cornered by the japanese manufacturers and how intel survived that period changes business model and became the company that it became today and it's a fantastic story of how the company had to reorient itself to change its way of uh, operating change the product that they were selling and focus on a little known product at that time which became the main product for the company in the future uh, which gives you a good idea of how complex this industry is and it's not very easy to have an outsider's view and learn about this industry without reading the history of all these companies but interestingly if you want to see a visual uh, way of looking at where everything is in the semiconductor ecosystem some of it is a little over simplified but it is not intact so for example if you want to design the chip you have to either go to a company which was uh, which is a uk company which owns the ip or an american company who owns the ip of the chip design or the architecture uh, if you want to use the software uh, well the software's ip also is from american companies like cadence synopsis uh, mentor graphics uh, if you want to buy the equipment uh, some of the equipment also has uh, western ip so asml is in europe uh, applied materials kla uh, they are in the us uh, only tenko uh, sorry only tokyo electron is in japan but some of the ip that is there comes from western companies or american or european companies so clearly the a uh, higher value part in this entire value chain comes from the american companies or the european companies uh, most importantly because uh, of course transistors were invest invented in the us 
but the whole silicon valley and the innovation culture and the way the funding was provided to all these companies to scale and create these business models that did not happen elsewhere in the world at the same pace at that time and which is why us has a significant advantage in the higher value items in the uh, intellectual property of semiconductors and if you see uh, the manufacturing side the foundry side clearly there are fewer foundries uh, in the west or in europe but there are more foundries in the asian countries like uh, most foundries actually like we saw in the map we have taiwan as the largest uh, share of foundry capacity followed by south korea then little bit in japan then some foundries are coming up in malaysia taiwan and even china is catching up but the problem is who controls all these things right there is a i would say uh, i mean i don't want to call it a cold war because it can escalate pretty badly if it grows up uh, touch wood it is not but uh, the problem is uh, china has been banned from using some of the technology by the us because of uh, defense uh, restriction national security uh, threats that they thought were happening so for example a company like huawei if you have seen what has happened with the company they cannot go with their chip designing program because they cannot access to the cutting edge technology from asml because asml has ip which is american and they cannot sell machines to a chinese company but they can sell machines to a taiwanese company which is a small island next to china mainland china so it is a tinder box in terms of a geopolitical situation don't know what is going to happen but uh, i think it's in the best interest of everyone to work together because although even though for example iphone manufactures its chips exclusively with tsmc in taiwan they still have to be sent across to mainland china to be assembled into the final iphone that we uh, use so made in china is still going to work because china is the largest uh, factory of the world and all chips have to go to china eventually uh, it seems so clearly the new capacity that people are building taiwan semiconductor putting up capacity in the us that is strategically important for them as well but it is going to be incremental it's not going to take care of the previous large part of the capacity which is still uh, in that geopolitical tinder box but it's an interesting uh, interesting delicate like a swiss watch uh, there are so many complications involved we just you can endlessly read about this and study this and see uh, what kind of ideas come to your mind but that you no know, all these lines across the world they are also crossing over india so let's take a final look at the last part of the presentation i'm sorry i've taken too much time uh as to what is happening in indian semiconductor industry uh, or is there any opportunity available for us as a country to become uh, ha have companies with one of these names you know in the industry can we become that big so the uh, association called uh, indian electronics and uh, semi association this is the trade body for uh, electronics companies in the country they came up with a nice paper in 2018 and this was i picked it up from the executive summary of that paper Uh, as to where does india stand so clearly we don't have a good quality r and d funding for creating our own chips so there are some chips which are designed indigenously in india which are used in a defense or in isro for the space programs or even a chip which was uh, part of the team which in iit madras they created a chip a few years back but it's a very specialized application of that chip it's not a chip which can be you know replaced you can it can replace an arm chip or a intel chip somewhere Uh, so yeah we don't have the r&d ecosystem uh, funding ecosystem in india we also uh, uh, we also don't have the manufacturing capacity in india we don't have fabrication plants in india at the scale that we saw which are required the scale is required because uh, this industry needs economies of scale to make money so we don't have scale fabrication plants we have one off fabrication plants with old technology so if we look at the cutting edge today we are actually 25 30 years behind in terms of creating the same ecosystem of manufacturers we don't have good package and assembly companies in india where in taiwan there is a second industry around tsmc which also packages and assembles chips properly in that same country and then it exports the finished product to uh, other assembly plants elsewhere so sub assembly has to happen nearby so that we don't have to send a chip across you can just send the assembled package across uh to your next vendor next uh, part of the supply chain but interestingly what is good in india so all these chip designing companies we saw earlier they have an indian outpost which also has an r&d and engineering team so uh, we have a good supply of engineers in india uh, and because of which the r&d and design ecosystem is quite good but unfortunately none of the ip is uh, our own it is owned by all these western companies and we'll have to work with them every time we cannot call anything indigenous in the chip manufacturing ecosystem but on the demand side we actually have a lot of demand in india 
uh, every single product uh, which is becoming digital uh, will require a chip uh, a, can be a car can be a washing machine dishwasher refrigerator air condition anything you can imagine which has a which requires electronic components inside uh, will require semiconductors and we are fully dependent on uh, the import market over here in fact this is uh, i think even surpassing the demand for oil in our country to some extent so clearly we are lacking in a lot of areas but design skills we do have so if some engineer tomorrow gets the right funding to design their own chip which can be then put into mainstream production uh, it will be interesting to see if somebody can take it up or even some of the large groups in the country have steered away from this sector for a long time they have not entered into chip manufacturing at all and for good reason because we saw how difficult it is uh, over a long period of time but interestingly if you see uh, the area where india can actually pick up some of the Uh, manufacturing capacity or design capacity is into the lower end chips so we did not discuss the analog chips or the mixed signal chips which are there which are made by companies like texas instruments or analog devices so these chips are also functional chips which have uh, which have uh, applications in defense uh, equipment which has application in uh, telecommunication equipment uh, or even some of the industrial automation uh, that we are doing they go into the robotic equipment so all these things they require different kinds of chips which are the technology is lower end the technology is also old you don't need to innovate too much over there all you have to do is design them for a proper application and over here there are a few companies here nothing in the listed space unfortunately uh, but there are a few companies here who are doing the work but i think most of the work does still happens even for these chips outside of india in terms of designing and manufacturing so to avo- to i think promote the industry uh, the ministry of information technology uh, they actually came up with a plan like the perform the the production linked scheme incentives for other electronic manufacturing they came up with a specs program which also has some incentives provided to people who put up uh, plants in india the interesting part is it does not mention that you have to put in uh, capacity for higher end plants any semiconductor plant can be uh, under this category and i think uh, this is a good start to have the ecosystem created in this place it might take a couple of decades for us to catch up to some of the even lowest end technology but still it is worthwhile to do it today if it is not done today we will forever be only consumers of technology without having any ip and just consuming electronic devices so if you see this is an interesting chart from counterpoint uh, research so what they did was they uh, mapped the capacity for older technology in some of the global foundries uh, some of the foundry companies globally and over here you can see TSMC is not a market leader yet because they have moved on to the next technology level. So they have vacated the market for some of the older technology manufacturing, which is still required for other cheaper devices or other kind of chips. Uh, but yeah, you clearly can fit an Indian company somewhere eventually if we start building that ecosystem today. So I think in conclusion, uh, a delicately balanced supply chain uh, in this. uh and people have uh, it's it's really really complex you really have to uh, work on so many different capital cycles to make sure that you work well and the innovation of that fabulous manufacturing which uh, taiwan semiconductor actually was the one of the first companies to come up with a pure contract manufacturing model that was the innovation that opened up this industry quite dramatically uh, in the 80s Uh, of course every vendor in the ecosystem needs to have very close integration with the manufacturers and that is very obvious now because with each software update software has to work with the hardware which was previously shipped if a product like a car is there nobody changes a car every 2 years like people change mobile phones so if you are going to update the software of a car it has to work consistently and that ecosystem has to be there integration has to be quite tight so far we have seen that winners in this sectors have taken the most of the market share uh it remains to be seen uh, what will happen in the future but uh the interesting part is despite the competitive intensity you can still generate a lot of profits it's not like it's a loss making industry con- continuously for a longest period of time of course we clearly have economies of scale uh, which matters a lot if you don't scale the factory fast enough in the technology you are going to grow in you will not be able to make a economic profit on your uh, manufacturing activity and we we saw the tailwinds that right? we have the organic tailwinds of more people using digital products uh, semiconductor penetration into the existing devices which otherwise are dumb right now analog devices uh, we also now have uh, lights which can be controlled by our voice assistants or google homes or something like that so all these things are coming up so penetration is increasing at the same time more number of people will use smartphones more people will use computers as literacy grows so that 
demographic trend also is uh, ongoing plus the interesting thing because we have a very good it services and engineering r and d services ecosystem in india there is a natural extension to all these services uh, to the indian players so this is where our opportunity is so like the taiwan may be good at making semiconductors but we are good at making uh, i would say it services uh, and uh, say pharma uh, so we are the pharmacy of the world uh, we are the it services hub of the world so we can definitely work on our strengths where we have strengths in engineering r and d services and these services can be scaled going ahead also uh, it directly enables a software integration ecosystem which has been there in enterprise software business but it has not come into industrial software or uh, automation tools or other things so the system integration mindset if somebody can pick up uh, they can actually become a good system integrator for industrial uh, applications going forward uh, before we conclude and take questions i just found a lot of helpful sources so the books i mentioned in the slides i'll put up the slides with the presentation on youtube but these books were quite helpful to build a good construct about how the industry works especially fabless also whatever words you have seen on the slides if you youtube any of these words you are going to get completely blown away with amazing technology and history of all the industries uh, and it can go into as much depth as you want technically or as much simplified explanation you want even simpler than what i have done and a better job than me of course with the company managements of all these companies there are good podcast interviews and youtube interviews available you can definitely go through them to get there from their point of view how they see technology evolving how their companies have evolved uh one thing notably i want to mention is a white papers written by nzs capital i think they are they are the best articulated white papers about how semiconductor industry has evolved and what are the investment opportunities there uh john badgate one of their uh, principles is a good good uh, i think a good source for understanding how this industry works another channel which i love which is so if you don't want to read the book how asia works this is a good channel to follow on youtube called asia asianometry and he also has a blog he does a good video walk through of all the history of these companies how they became what they are today and lastly since most of the companies have a very long listing history you will find very rich quality disclosures and you can put numbers to the narrative so it's not like this is all narrative and it's going uh, out of our hand by just imagination this there's a lot of numbers behind it you can actually see the capital cycles play out brutally for all these companies across several decades uh, and there are good disclosures over there so i think that's it uh, i am sorry to take so much of your time but would love to take questions if you have any thank you if anyone has any questions please unmute yourselves and ask the question hi raj i have a question uh, ronak a wonderful presentation and detail thank you very much thanks i just wanted to understand that uh, the chip manufacturing is concentrated only in taiwan and that particular part of the world or even the us has poured in capital into companies in southeast asia or that part or how does it work the ecosystem of investments exports and the, the demand so the chart i showed you earlier with the geographical distribution of foundries that was only for the pure play foundries who are contract manufacturer of semiconductors so companies like intel have traditionally also invested uh, in the us to create their own facilities uh, even texas instruments has invested heavily to create their own fabrication plants so it's not like uh, east only has the manufacturing capacity but if you want to look at uh, contract manufacturing that is uh, mainly focused in the east uh, part of the world whereas in the western part there are mostly companies who design and make their own chips they have built their facilities over there but clearly intel also has facilities in these areas because it's a lucrative area it has the other ecosystem advantage of being in that area and uh, cost will be cheaper to hire employees to Uh, manage the ecosystem of packaging and testing over there than what you could do purely in the us so incremental investments have happened outside of the us but now the tide has reversed because of the geopolitical nature of this industry people are coming back to the western region to invest and build fabrication plants there okay thank you since i made the presentation i know it was not very comprehensive so you will definitely have more questions so sachin is sachin says photolithography reminded me glass tracing exactly yes so uh, i mean photolithography has come a very long way and in the context of chip manufacturing it will just blow your mind if you see how the uh, latest uh, euv machines actually work 
and uh, the video that i mentioned in the youtube uh, so in the slides on youtube that video is a must watch you cannot miss it because it will just open up your eyes to a totally different reality of where engineering is now everybody is appreciation your presentation i think no one else has any questions anyone yes. else having questions please unmute yourself yeah uh, do you ever see india making these chips or being a hub for uh, chip making because of the labor cost and possibly our situation of you know becoming a larger economy in the digital space so we wish to become right i mean in in many other industries people are talking about china plus one but in this particular industry uh, china does not have a huge advantage right now because like i said earlier they are banned from using some of the latest technology so they are on the uh i think they're building it they're not on cutting edge so they're actually on the older technologies they are unable to scale factories uh, even companies like taiwan semiconductor have not made investments in china because then you cannot access technology if you are on the mainland so india has the advantage of doing that but we are decades behind in many of these fundamental industrial things uh, and some of the government incentives will help definitely to at least uh, you know make people aware that this is incentives available and uh, there are other things also so you may have skilled engineers to design chips but you may not have the employees required who can use these machines well so there has to be a training ecosystem for that uh, after the training ecosystem will create a lot of employees graduates they will then be part of the uh, actual manufacturing process so manufacturing is slightly more advanced but designing if we are good at that and if we can say augment it with our it services and ability to design engineering services and do r and d in that area i think that is the natural trajectory for advancing and being on the cutting edge but for all the chip manufacturing stuff it looks a little difficult right now but it's a good step by the government to at least provide an incentive for specifically semiconductor manufacturing okay i think we can wrap up the q and a session we can then have a, a informal chat once you stop the recording yes so thanks everyone for attending uh, i'll put up the slides very soon with the video on youtube so you can also then go back and look at some of the terms to uh, google them on youtube and learn about them and don't forget to watch the video on youtube from seeker uh, thanks so much Whenever things got rough I always remember what my father used to say Running a business does test a man my son there are ups and downs glorious highs and sometimes a low that leaves you feeling defeated The character of a man and the character of a business are not very different are they Yes but when the chips are down We must stand up. Dust ourselves off and more wrong. Volatility. It's a funny thing. It makes you question yourself and wonder if you've made all the right decisions. Sure, you can question some of your decisions, but stay steadfast on your goals. Dad always said, there are no shortcuts and no quick profits. There are no free lunches, are there? There is only one right way. At PPFS, we think like Rahul and his father. That volatility is a fact of running a business, and buying equity shares is like owning a part of that business. We use value investing principles to manage your money. This means we invest in the right businesses at reasonable prices and. for a longer term PPFAS mutual fund there's only one right way mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully mutual fund investments are subject to market risks read all scheme related documents carefully